Hello. Welcome back to our series on the elements of the spiritual life. We are following Anglican theologian F.P. Harton's 1930 book, 1932 book of the same name. We started talking last time about the cardinal virtues, and the first of those virtues, justice. Today we're going to talk about two more of the virtues, temperance and fortitude. In our sections today, Harton summarizes where we've been. Quote, we have seen that the object of the cardinal virtues is the direction of human activity towards its right end. Thus, justice is concerned with the right fulfillment of one's duty towards one's neighbor, and temperance with the right government of oneself in regard to sensible pleasures and created things. These virtues are neither heroic nor showy, but are, as their name implies, the solid hinges upon which the character hangs. The heroism and glow of Christian character spring from the theological virtues, which unite the soul with God, but the cardinal virtues must not be decried on that account, for without them faith, hope, and charity would have no solid material upon which to work. We covered the theological virtues first because they are primary in the spiritual life, but these four virtues of justice, temperance, fortitude, and prudence are the raw material upon which the theological virtues work. Just like it's hard to know how to love someone until we know how to be just towards them, until we know how to give them their rights, so also with all the rest. But I think this leads to an important question, something that I think has been niggling at the back of our minds. Is the church more like a classroom or a gym? Growing up, I absorbed an understanding that growing in my faith was primarily about learning new things. We heard sermons every week that were at least 30 minutes long. We went to hour-long Sunday school classes, and then we went back for one to two hours of more instruction on Wednesday nights. I certainly thought of church as a classroom where my job was to learn. While learning is absolutely essential in the spiritual life, I think we shouldn't think of the church that way. Instead, following Harton, I think we should think of the church as a gem where our job is to grow. The church is crossfit for the soul. We can learn all we want to about getting in shape, but we won't get in shape until we make a habit of exercise and healthy eating in and out of the gym. In the same way, we can learn all we want to about growing in Christ but we won't actually grow in Christ until we make a habit of prayer in and out of church. I think it's important to say that, say that now because of the next virtue we're going to discuss, temperance. What do we think of when we hear the word temperance? My first thoughts are of the temperance movement. That early 20th century movement pushed for prohibition in the United States so in my mind, temperance was at first tied solely to alcohol. But in the sense of the virtue, that is not the case. Temperance isn't only about alcohol, and it certainly isn't about abstinence from alcohol. Temperance is a more robust virtue than that. So what is temperance's purpose? The first purpose of this virtue, Harton writes, is the keeping of the body in the right place. Why? to enable us to attain the end for which we were created. In the end, it's not about self-control, though it is a necessary building block. In the end, for Christians, this virtue is about allowing God to be in control. In fact, for St. Ignatius, temperance is the foundation of the spiritual life. In his teachings on discernment, he says that we ought to use created things just, as, just so far as they help us to attain our end, in other words, the end for which God created us, and we ought to withdraw ourselves from them just so far as they hinder us. Think of a person who wants to run their first marathon. They already have a habit of running on a regular basis. Let's say they can run a 5K with no problem. But to get to the point where they can run a marathon, they're going to have to change a lot about their habits. They will have to run more which means they will have less time for other things. They will have to get good sleep on a regular basis, which means they will have to give up late-night Netflix binges. They will have to eat and drink differently, which means they will have to give up some of their favorite food and drink. 
their whole life will take on the shape of preparing to run a marathon. They will be growing in temperance. In a similar way, Christians too have a goal. We strive to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as St. Paul says. We press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call in Christ Jesus. We are aiming at nothing less than the fullness of goodness for our lives. We are aiming at one day being able to see God as God is. If the vision of God is our goal then like the marathoner, there will have to be changes to our lives. Unlike popular opinion, Harton writes, Christian asceticism is not directed towards the destruction of the body, but its subjection to the spirit, and this involves the careful regulation of our bodies. Specifically, we talk about the regulation of what Harton calls the pleasures of sense. There are two types of pleasures— sinful pleasures and legitimate pleasures. Temperance isn't about moderating sinful pleasures. No, we want those things gone. Temperance is about moderating our legitimate pleasures. Harton writes, for example, it is not right to refuse to eat because there is a sin of gluttony, but it is necessary to use food temperately, whether one is tempted to gluttony or not. Temperance is not about avoiding sin. It's about using good things in moderation. Temperance is, then, the right and ordered use of created things. It's important to understand that this is the right and ordered use for you. We apply temperance based on who we have been called to be and what we have been called to do. Some people are called to singleness. Some people are called to fast more regularly than others. Some people are called to abstain from alcohol. Some people, like me, are called to ministry and therefore must practice temperance in different ways than others because we have been called to provide a wholesome example for our congregations. What we do with temperance differs based on our vocations. But don't take that vocational view of temperance as an excuse to avoid being temperate. What is right for you is something you have to work out with God in prayer and with your faith community in conversation. Now, you might be thinking, wow, being a Christian is way more work than I thought. It's true. That's why so many of the baptized have reverted to, as Harton puts it, an easier gospel of self-expression. This is the gospel that screams at us from every advertisement and self-help bookshelf. It says, don't worry, God doesn't want anything more from you than who you already are. There's nothing to grow into because you are already the fullness of what God desires you to be. But this gospel is not actually good news. What the ancients discovered in these cardinal virtues, what the church found in the theological virtues and the gifts of the Spirit, which we'll talk about later, is that true human happiness comes from growth. And telling ourselves we don't need to grow is just a way to make ourselves feel better while we're stuck in the frustration and pain of stagnation. Growth, whether we're running a marathon or working out our salvation with fear and trembling, takes effort. We will be tempted to quit. At that point, it's important to remember that the virtue of temperance is infused. As we've said before, that means temperance already exists in us and that we all we have to do is cooperate with it for the virtue to grow. We have temperance implanted in us in creation, and for the baptized, the virtue is aided by the indwelling spirit who continually pours God's grace out within us. Even though we are often hard-pressed, we are always aided in this matter by God. That's a lot, we might say. I'm not sure I'm strong enough for that work. Here is where we need see the need for the third cardinal virtue. Fortitude. Harton writes, The Christian virtues are not popular, and those who are in earnest about their religion must expect to have every possible hindrance thrown in their way by their companions in the world. Opposition, ridicule, often actual persecution are the world's reaction to Christ, and if the Christian is to persevere in the imitation of his master, they will need a strength of character more than their own. 
Such strength is also needed against the many wiles of the devil and one's own weakness. The acquisition of virtue is no easy thing, nor is it accomplished all at once. Much patient, hard work is necessary before the virtues begin to flower, and the soul is frequently tempted to give up. The middle-aged person who has lost the joy of fervor, who knows what it is to see ideals vanish and God hide God's self, as well as the discouragement of repeated falls into the same sin which takes the life out of their confessions, needs strength not their own. No less than the young person beset by the world and the flesh, the strength, that is, that perseveres quietly and steadily in the dark. Such perseverance is the fruit of the virtue of fortitude, which, as it is practiced, practiced produces in the soul that level strength which is characteristic of the spiritual person. We can see from Harton's description that the Christian character is essentially strong. We are not growing in Christ to be pushovers or people who are pious on Sundays but leave the rest of the week to our own devices. But just like we said about temperance, things do get hard. At that point, it is important to remind ourselves that just like temperance, fortitude is infused in us in creation and aided by God's grace given us by the indwelling spirit. Harton writes, We shall meet this virtue again in a higher form among the gifts of the Spirit, which is a comforting reflection. For God at no time leaves the soul that desires God without the strength necessary to attain its goal. Fortitude is always there, enabling the soul to live constantly at the highest level of which it is capable and giving it the staying power necessary for its perfection. As Harton wraps up his description of fortitude, he says something important, something he doesn't fully develop. He says this, The Christian is strong because Jesus is so, for it is the very strength of Jesus which is ours by the virtue of fortitude. Let's unpack that a bit. St. Luke says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. He grew in the virtues throughout his life and perfected them in his life and death. Therefore, when we are in Christ by holy baptism, the cardinal virtues are no longer generically human for us. When we grow in virtue, we are growing in Christ's justice, Christ's temperance, Christ's fortitude, and Christ's prudence. This will become important when we talk more about praying with Scripture later on. In the meantime, it is encouraging to know that as we grow, Jesus has already walked the path we are on. He has struggled just as we have. He understands, and he is there beside us every step of the way. In conclusion, temperance is the right ordering of our lives towards our goal, which is God, and fortitude is the strength of Christ working itself out in us, enabling us to stand firm and grow. Which virtue speaks most to you today? What's one thing you could do this week to cooperate with Jesus' work in your life? Next week, we're going to finish talking about the cardinal virtues as we talk about the virtue of prudence. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. <laughs>